Welcome to Truth Seekers Health Justice. This is Michelle Swenson. Today we pose the questions, why is the United States the only wealthy nation that does not have universal health care? Why does the United States spend almost twice as much as any other nation and still have worse health outcomes, including maternal and child mortality and life expectancy? We will hear four different doctors talk about the barriers to good health care in America and the advantages of Medicare for All, single risk pool health insurance. Dr. Anthony Eitan grew up in Montreal, Canada, a country that has a strong social compact with its citizens. In a 2016 TED Talk, he describes the strong social supports he knew in Canada and contrasts that with his experience arriving in the United States as a medical student. Let me tell you about where I grew up. Montreal, Canada is a beautiful, cosmopolitan and diverse city. It's a city that's rich in parks, an open space, outdoor cafes, public art, street theater, high-quality housing, and a state-of-the-art public transportation system. My brothers and I grew up in Montreal in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, and we felt nurtured by that city. Canada has a strong social compact with its citizens. We all know Canada has universal health care, but it's also got a universal child care benefit, paid vacation, guaranteed sick leave, high-quality community resources, parks, recreation centers, and community infrastructure, and highly subsidized post-secondary education. I went to McGill University basically for free. Canada invests in its citizens. When I graduated college, I was told that Johns Hopkins was the best medical school in the world. When I landed at Hopkins, I was delighted. I was elated to have been accepted there, and I walked through the doors out into the community. I landed in East Baltimore, and I had never seen anything like it. I was being toured around by an upperclassman, and he saw the look of shock on my face, and he said, what's wrong with you? And I managed to stammer, when was there a war here? I'll never forget what he said to me. He looked at me with this look of utter disdain, and he said, what'd you expect? It's the inner city. What did I expect? I was supposed to expect this? These atrocious, and dehumanizing conditions were a norm in an American city. And I was left to wonder, is the U.S. really a first world country? I saw children in the clinics at Johns Hopkins, and I couldn't help but wonder, what would have happened to me if I'd grown up in East Baltimore? Would I have been able to attend Johns Hopkins Medical School and become a doctor? What is owed to these children? They didn't create this environment, yet they have to navigate it every single day of their lives. What is the American social compact? Does it even exist? Unlike Canada or other Western democracies, the U.S. doesn't have universal health care. It doesn't certainly have a universal child care benefit. It doesn't have highly subsidized post-secondary education. The U.S. doesn't have much by way of universal social benefit policies at all. This is the land of the so-called American dream. But what are the fundamental agreements that underlie that dream? As I looked around East Baltimore, I had a hard time imagining any social compact whatsoever. And I wondered, for the low-income residents of East Baltimore, whether they really ever had a meaningful shot at the American dream. I noticed something else in East Baltimore. As I wandered around and looked into the eyes of children, I started to notice something that was very disturbing. I noticed an absence of hope, an absence of light. These kids were barraged with a message every single day of their lives that they weren't valued that they didn't matter, and they internalized that. And that caused frustration and anger and eventually despair and a loss of hope. And as that happened, you could see the lights literally turning off in their eyes. This is what happens to people when they feel they don't have control, when they don't have a sense of agency. So here I was, this young medical student at this prestigious medical school, and I felt like I was learning so much about medicine. But outside the walls of the fortress Johns Hopkins, I had no idea what was happening in the streets. And this question started to incubate in my mind. In America, when it comes to your health, does your zip code matter more than your genetic code? After graduation from Johns Hopkins, Dr. Eitan studied the impact of social infrastructure, or lack thereof, in cities around the U.S. 
In Baltimore, there are neighborhoods where, on average, people only live to 58 years old. We went to Minneapolis, St. Paul, to Seattle, to Philadelphia, to Boston, to New York, to Cleveland, to LA, everywhere we looked, we found life expectancy differences on the order of 15, 20, 25 years in the same city. So what's happening in these low life expectancy communities? Well, very simply put, these communities are functioning like incubators of chronic stress. Our fractured social compact has rendered these places without the basic social, political, and economic infrastructure that people need to be able to pursue the American dream. Bad schools, poor housing, inadequate health care, poor transportation, lack of jobs, high crime, neighborhoods that are policed like military zones, a lack of access to parks, grocery stores, and even in some cases, no access to fresh, safe drinking water. Any human being placed in such circumstances inevitably develops chronic stress. Chronic stress makes it much more likely that you'll develop cardiovascular disease, diabetes, many forms of inflammation. That's how the outside world gets under the skin and changes our physiology. Chronic stress actually changes physiology, it changes your behavior, and it changes how your genes are expressed. So chronic stress, which is driven by the policies that we've created, is as lethal as any knife or any gun. It's not just low-income people. The U.S. life expectancy now is 43rd in the world and slipping. So we know that 80% of what affects our health happens outside the healthcare system. The low-income people in East Baltimore didn't create East Baltimore. Government policies and private policies created East Baltimore. Why? Because of a narrative of exclusion. A narrative says that those low-income populations are not entitled to a fair and robust social compact. And the consequence of this is dramatic. And it's not just low-income people. Increasing data suggests that white, educated, and insured populations in this country are in much worse health than their peers internationally. This broken social compact hurts all of us. I'm not immune. You're not immune. It's a $3 trillion enterprise. It's bankrupting us and it's not improving our health. Dr. Anthony Iton became Senior Vice President of Healthy Communities at the California Endowment, where he has overseen a 10-year billion dollar initiative through which he worked with 10 underserved communities to improve the health status of low-income Californians. His longtime goals center on his passion for the need to eliminate health inequities, seeking to build social, political, and economic power among residents of under-resourced communities. A 2020 Yale study posted in the Lancet Medical Journal was reported by Dr. Allison Galvani, an epidemiologist from the Yale School of Public Health. Medicare for All will cover 80 million who now have inadequate or no health coverage, providing a universal system of health care such as that proposed in the Medicare for All Act. We found that Medicare for All would save over $450 billion compared to what the country is paying now. Overall, it will reduce costs for both the taxpayer households as well as the employer because it will eliminate the even higher costs of health care premiums paid by individuals and employers. It will also eliminate deductibles, co-pays, and all these other fees. Medicare for All will minimize paperwork and will streamline administration and billing. So currently, Medicare has an overhead of 2.2%, whereas private insurance is over 12%. Right now, the U.S. is paying more than any other country for health care, yet we don't even rank in the top 30 for key public health measures, including infant mortality and overall life expectancy. Virtually every other industrialized country and many that are lower and, and middle income countries offer universal health care. For instance, Costa Rica has a per capita GDP that's about one fifth ours per capita, and they have universal health care. For the last 30 years, they have had a higher life expectancy than the U.S. Dr. Galvani notes 
that only Medicare for All provides a full choice of doctors and hospitals. You truly can keep your doctor. By contrast, private insurers put up barriers, often shrinking their networks of doctors and hospitals to deny full choice. People would have more choice. Everyone would have more choice because with Medicare for All, there would be no distinction between out-of-network and in-network barriers. So not only would you be able to keep your doctor, if there was a different doctor you preferred, you would be able to switch. In their book, Citizen's Guide to Medicare, Drs. Abdul El Sayed and Micah Johnson describe what it would mean to have a cost-effective working health care system that prioritizes preventive health care. The reason I'm so passionate about this issue is when I went to medical school and now as a doctor, seeing how the system as it stands and also most of the political conversation doesn't meet the challenges that patients are facing every day. We've kept hearing the industry's talking points parroted back to us um, rather than people situating this question of what we ought to do in healthcare uh, in their own lives and their own experiences. Um, we wanted to take this out of the conversations that had been had in the lead up to both the 2016 and 2020 primaries uh, and put it back into a conversation about what healthcare means for us, what the consequences of healthcare being what it is in the United States means for our daily lives and uh, the lives of our families and what it would mean to actually build a healthcare system that really does take on the challenges that we live in our lives and does what almost every other high income country in the world does, which is recognize that the government has a responsibility to take up this issue and provide us the kind of sureness that we want from our insurance that we do not get. Since the time of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, big corporate interests have opposed universal healthcare. There's a few reasons we ended up being the only country that doesn't have a universal health care plan and a few of the factors that came in time and time again over the last hundred years. One is opposition from the healthcare industry. And the second is racial discrimination. And you saw this, for instance, in first in the 1930s when FDR was initially going to make health care part of the New Deal. But he said that he just couldn't stand up to the state medical societies. They're just too powerful. So didn't even propose health care as part of Social Security and waited to the 1940s when then Harry Truman, as sitting president, was a sponsor of a single payer health care plan. And then it was doctors, mostly organized through the American Medical Association, that took down the plan with the single most expensive lobbying campaign in the history of the country to defeat single payer health care in the 1940s but they teamed up with Southern segregationists in Congress. So you have racial discrimination and industry working together to block healthcare reform. And you almost saw that again in the 1960s with Medicare, where again, it was the healthcare industry and it was Southerners who didn't want to have Southern hospitals integrate if Medicare was passed, who teamed up to block Medicare for years and years until it finally passed. That's how universal healthcare got blocked. And then along the way, we started developing a private employer-based insurance system. And that has grown with the failure to enact a universal public plan. We now have this patchwork of public and private mixtures that still leaves 30 million people out. A patchwork of private insurances still leaves 30 million uninsured and more than that underinsured. Dr. Johnson relates the effects of inefficient, costly, U.S. healthcare on one couple who each experienced a healthcare emergency. She ended up spending nine days at the hospital. She had a very rare form of heart attack called a spontaneous coronary artery dissection. And she had a defibrillator. She had a mechanical heart pump for several days, discharged on all sorts of prescription drugs, needing to do cardiac rehab. But that wasn't the worst of it. She started getting bills for over $100,000. With the deductible plan, they tried to save on premium costs by getting a high deductible plan like so many Americans. They had to eventually start a GoFundMe page for their friends and family to chip in just to keep them afloat. But then January 1st rolled around, their deductible reset, they were back at square one trying to pay for the ongoing treatment. The human toll of this beyond the financial toll is Lisa says that the hours spent on the phone with the insurance companies, the hospitals, the imaging centers, there were times when those things were more stressful than her own cardiac arrest or her husband's brain cancer diagnosis. 
So the reason Lisa's story is so important is that it debunks the myth that people with private insurance are doing fine in our current system. They're not. Lisa and Dominic had private insurance. They had employer-based insurance through Dominic's job, and they were still left to bear the brunt of the failures of our healthcare system. That's what's changed over the last few decades. We now have the broad middle class, folks like Lisa and Dominic, that have what is supposed to be the best health insurance that the country can offer that are still getting hurt by the system. And I want to give folks a sense of why our system is so broken. The way that our healthcare system works is that there are really two huge sectors, industries that exchange funds in our system. You've got the health insurance industry here, and you've got the hospitals and, and clinics and doctors over here. And if you think about it, you, for the privilege of being covered by an insurance company, are going to pay every two weeks, you and your employer, something called a premium, so that that insurance company is there for you. But if you're going to get sick, you go to the clinic in the hospital, you get your services, and then they don't bill you for that. They bill your insurance company. So there's a financial transaction that happens between the insurer, the payer, and the provider. And between these two industries, there's a whole lot of jockeying around the price of care that leaves the cost of care going up on everyone and doesn't really protect you from that uh, overall costs in the way that insurance companies have devised things like deductibles, which is a paywall for the healthcare that you already paid for, or coinsurance. All of that means that the cost of healthcare goes up on you and it's less secure for you. So going to this question of Medicare for all, what it offers us, it's not just that it would cover all of the health care that you would need to keep yourself healthy and alive. It's the fact that now, instead of having multiple different insurance companies on this side, you've got one, right? And that is Medicare or the government. And because you have one, all of the overhead costs that went into allowing these folks to crosstalk in the first place goes away. And these folks can set the price for care, which means that the escalator that keeps uh, the cost of healthcare going up also goes away. And because it's the government and you're a taxpayer or even you're a resident of the country, the insurance system is there for you, whether you change jobs, lose your job, turn 26, whatever, other, all the other reasons that people lose healthcare in America. A lot of people are left out of, of that for-profit insurance system. It leaves out about 10% of people. And in this system, uh, what we're doing is asking people to pay their fair share. And as a taxpayer, a resident of the United States of America, you get that healthcare. It doesn't matter what happens to you. It puts the sure back in insurance. What would happen under Medicare for All is instead of getting paid by one of the several hundred private insurance companies, all the patients would get reimbursed by, by Medicare. Everyone would have guaranteed access to healthcare under Medicare for All. And then when they go in to see their doctors and hospitals, they get reimbursed by Medicare for All, similar to how they get paid by Medicare today. To understand the negotiating power that a program like Medicare Today or Medicare for All has, take the example of Medicare Today. It's just such an enormous pool of patients because so many patients are on Medicare. You have over 98% of doctors and hospitals are taking Medicare patients. By doing it through Medicare for All, as opposed to through the Affordable Care Act, where you're just one insurance company on one piece of the insurance market in one geographic location, you don't actually have that much leverage. That's why you have a lot of narrow networks in private insurance plans. That's one of the, the tools that companies use to, to compete with each other, and then patients are left out with narrow networks. Dr. Johnson describes how having good, reliable, cost-effective health care coverage improves other social determinants. Changing to a single-payer payment system frees up money for other needs. We often think about, we separate the social determinants of health, where you live, where, what kind of job you have, whether you have access to healthy food on one side, and then we say we have the healthcare system on the other side. But really, the way that we pay for healthcare makes all of those other things worse. Where, you know, some of the research here finds that each year, medical costs put nearly 10 million families into poverty and hundreds of thousands of families into bankruptcy. So it's not surprising that when they do studies of what happened when, for instance, Medicaid expansion happened and lots more people got health insurance. Well, it turned out that evictions went down and food security got better and the ability for people to find good jobs got better. The question we ought to be asking right now is how in God's name can we afford to pay for a healthcare system that costs on average 1.7 to two times as much as other high income countries spend per person? Once we've answered that question, the obvious question then should become, all right, how do we fix that? And Medicare for all doesn't just more equitably transfer the costs of healthcare 
but it also reduces the overall costs of healthcare. Almost every analysis that has looked at this has shown that. And it reduces it by reducing the overhead that we pay into things like CEOs' salaries, advertising budgets on behalf of health insurers. And it reduces the army of billers that we need on both the healthcare and the insurance side. In all those ways, it reduces the cost. The Congressional Budget Office, who in the policy world is kind of the gold standard scorekeepers for what things would cost, did an extensive analysis of Medicare for All, and they agreed that it would cost less than our current system under almost all the different ways that it could be designed. It just seems like it should cost more to cover everyone, but it's not. And you know the reason is, well, it's our current dysfunctional system is the most expensive one in the world. The amount of money and political power that is aligned against Medicare for all, I'll be honest with you, is an indictment against the way that our democracy has been in a lot of ways corrupted by money and political power. You look at poll after poll, and at least a majority of people support this. When I say money and power, the insurance industry in 2020 made bumper profits, many billions of dollars more than they ever thought they would because of the cancellation of elected procedures, which are a major lifeline for hospitals. They spent in the same year $151 million to lobby their elected officials, right? Many of whom they have spent money to get elected. On top of that, they spent millions of dollars running ads on TV to fear monger us about how much Medicare for all was going to cost, about how it was going to ration healthcare, about how it was going to eliminate choice. 845 lobbyists they employ in and around Capitol Hill. That's nearly two per elected member of Congress. What this says is that they know that real reform, Medicare for all, would be an existential threat to business as they know it. When your business is not aligned with people's basic healthcare rights. The question we have to ask is, why are we allowing this kind of corporate influence into our politics in the first place? And what could we have if we were to step up against it? And so in some respects, the fight for Medicare for all is part and parcel of the fight for true democracy in the sense that we have taken the money and the power that major corporations can leverage into our politics out of the picture and empowered our elected officials to do the will of the people. That really is what has to happen if we're going to get there. My hope is that people take note of how far we've come and how hard they're pushing against us to recognize that actually the one thing they want us to believe is that we cannot win. And the one thing we have to do is make sure that we come together because we can. The U.S. is the only country that places excessive corporate profiteering at the center of our healthcare system and the only country where people experience excessive medical debt and bankruptcy. This is Michelle Swenson. Thank you for joining Truth Seekers Health Justice. Advocates for Medicare for All, the only cost-effective universal health care. Because everyone does better when everybody is covered.